วัสดีครับผมผู้ช่วยศาสตราจารย์ดรศักชายตั้งวรวิทย์ในนามคณะกรรมการการจัดการประชุมยินดีต้อนรับทุกท่านเข้าสู่การประชุมวิชาการระดับชาติและนานาชาติครั้งที่17 NCCIT และ IC2 IT 2021 Good morning, presenters, participants, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Assistant Professor Dr. Nathapon Budagrit. On behalf of the IC2IT and NCCIT committees and organizer, we are delighted to welcome everyone to the 17th International and National Conference on Computer and Information Technology. The IC2IT and NCCIT are organized by the Faculties of Information Technology and Digital Innovation, King Mungut's Universities of Technology, North Bangkok. ในการจัดประชุมวิชาการครั้งนี้เราได้มีเครือข่ายความร่วมมือต่างประเทศประกอบไปด้วย Bern University in Hagen, Germany, Chemnitz University, Germany. โอกาโฮมาสเตทยูนิเวอร์ซิตี้สหรัฐอเมริกาอิดิคโคเรนยูนิเวอร์ซิตี้ออสเตรเลียฮานอยเนชันแนลออฟอิดิเคชันเวียดนามและ GI p u b l i s h e r เยอรมนีการจัดประชุมวิชาการและระดับชาติและนานาชาติครั้งนี้เรายังมีความร่วมมือกับเครือข่ายในประเทศประกอบด้วยมหาวิทยาลัยเทคโนโลยีราชมงคลคัญญบุรีมหาวิทยาลัยเทคโนโลยีราชมงคลกรุงเทพมหาวิทยาลัยราชพัฒกาญจนบุรีคณะวิทยาการสารสนเทศมหาวิทยาลัยมหาสารคามคณะสถิติประยุกสถาบันบัณฑิตพัฒนาบริหารศาสตร์คณะเทคโนโลยีสารเทศมหาวิทยาลัยราชพัฒเพชรบุรีและสภาคณะบุรีคณะเทคโนโลยีสารเทศแห่งประเทศไทย We are thankful to the partners of IC2IT and NCCIT. International partners are Fern Universities in Hagen, Germany. Chemnitz University, Germany, Oklahoma State University, USA, Edith Cohen University, Australia, Hanoi National Universities of Education, Vietnam, and GI Public Church, Germany. Thailand partners are Rajamangkara Universities of Technology, Thanyaburi, Rajamangkara Universities of Technology, Krung Thep, Kanchanaburi Rajapat University. Faculties of Informatics, Mahasarakam University. Faculties of Applied Statistics, uh, National Institutes of Development Administration. Faculties of Information Technology, Petburi, Rajapat University, and Councils of IT Deans of Thailand. For the presentation of IC2IT and NCCIT, we will do it in a virtual conference, which will be held in two days. The day 13. และ14พฤษภาคม2564 The IC2IT and NCCIT virtual conference will be held for two days on May 13 to 14 2021สำหรับการจัดประชุมวันแรกวันที่13พฤษภาคม2564เราจะเริ่มกันในเวลา8นาฬิกา30นาทีซึ่งจะเป็นการรายงานการจัดประชุมวิชาการโดยท่านคณะบดีคณะเทคโนโลยีสารสนเทศและนวัตกรรมดิจิทัลผู้ช่วยศาสตราจารย์ดรสุนันทาสดสีและในลำดับถัดไปจะเป็นการกล่าวเปิดงานโดยท่านรองอธิการบดีมหาวิทยาลัยเทคโนโลยีพระจอมเก้าพระนครเหนือศาสตราจารย์ดรสมฤกษ์จันทรอำพร On the first day, the program starts at 8:30 a.m. The deans of the faculties of information technology and digital innovation, Assistant Professor Dr. s u n a n t a Sudsi, will give a conference. Report followed by an opening speech of our Vice President, Professor Dr. s o m l e k a n t r a a m p o n ในลำดับถัดไปในเวลา9นาฬิกาท่านจะได้พบกับ keynote speaker จำนวน3ท่านประกอบด้วย1ท่านดรพงศธรสายสุจริตจากมหาวิทยาลัยเทคโนโลยีพระจอมเก้าพระนครเหนือลำดับถัดไป Professor Dr. Dr. Wu k a n g A. Harang จาก Bern University in Hagen, Germany, and in the last step, Dr. Lisa Armstrong from Edith Cohen University, Australia. Our first keynote speaker is Dr. Phong Sathon Sai Sujari from King Mongkut University of Technology, North Bangkok. Our second keynote speaker is Professor Dr. Dr. Wolfgang A. Harlang from Bern University, Germany. 
And our last keynote speaker is Dr. Lisa Armstrong from Edith Cowan University, Australia. ลำดับถัดไปในเวลา13นาฬิกาถึง17นาฬิกาขอเชิญผู้เข้าร่วมประชุมวิชาการ IC2AT และ NCCAT เข้าร่วมในรูปแบบ Virtual Conference พร้อมกันทั้ง6เซสชัน Welcome back to our first day for the virtual conference in this afternoon session. สำหรับในวันที่2นะครับเราจะเริ่มงานการประชุมวิชาการระดับชาติและนานาชาติด้านคอมพิวเตอร์และเทคโนโลยีสารสนเทศครั้งที่7ในเราจะเริ่มในเวลา9นาฬิกาถึง17นาฬิกาโดยจํานวนห้องนะครับ IC2 IT จํานวน1ห้องและ NCC IT จํานวน5ห้อง On the second day, the virtual presentation starts from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. One section for IC to IT and five section for NCC IT. สำหรับคำแนะนําในการเข้าร่วมประชุมวิชาการ IC to IT และ NCC IT ในรูปแบบเวอร์ชวลคอนเฟรนซ์ทางคณะผู้จัดงานได้ขอแนะนําให้ท่านหนึ่งท่านจัดเตรียมอุปกรณ์ในการเข้าร่วมประชุมซึ่งอาจจะประกอบไปด้วยหูฟังไมค์กล้องและอันดับที่สองท่านจะต้องมีการดาวน์โหลดโปรแกรม WebEx Meeting และรายละเอียดในการเข้าไปร่วมประชุมโดยช่วนคอนเฟรนซ์ครั้งนี้ทางผู้จัดงานได้ส่งรายละเอียดไปทางอีเมลซึ่งจะประกอบไปด้วยผู้นำเสนอผลงานและผู้เข้าร่วมการประชุมวิชาการ We would like to brief how to use the virtual conference system for devices Please prepare earphones or headset, microphones and web camera For presenters, please prepare PowerPoint or PDF presentation files For the WebEx meeting software, you can download via the registered email. There are two channels where you can access to the virtual conference meeting. The first channel is available for the presenter, and the second channel is available for the participants. For all the participants, please make sure that you mute the microphones while joining the virtual conference system. Korean c h e n คณะบดีคณะเทคโนโลยีสารเทศและนวัตกรรมดิจิทัลมหาวิทยาลัยเทคโนโลยีพระจอมเกล้าพระนครเหนือประธานการจัดงานการประชุมวิชาการครั้งนี้ผู้ช่วยศาสตราจารย์ดรสุนทราสดศรีกล่าวรายงานการประชุม At this time I would like to invite the assistant professor Dr s u n a n t a s o s i the dean of the faculties of information technology and digital innovations And the general chairs of the conference to give a briefing of the conference. Welcome all participants and researchers to join the conference, the National Conference on Computing and Information Technology (NCCIT) and the International Conference on Computing and Information Technology (IC2IT). For this year, we have known that we have got the situation about the COVID-19 pandemic. But from our side, the academic university network, we also would like to set up the platform to serve all participants and researchers to chain to share the knowledge from the academic side, not only from the computer side, but also information technology as well. For this year, from our side, the academic partners try to set up the platform to generate the virtual conference. In order to support the researchers that have got the effect from the COVID-19 pandemic, in this year we also get the great chance from three keynote speakers: one from Germany, one from Australia, and one from Thailand. For the special thanks, this conference could not be happened without these special thanks to many people. The first person, the president of Kim Mong Kut University of Technology in North Bangkok, Professor Dr. Suchat Singh s i n for his support and give us the great chance to set up this conference. As well as, we would like to give the special thanks to the academic partners, not only from the university in Thailand. The conference. Would not be happened without this person. First of all, we would like to give their special thanks to the president of Kim Mong Kut University of Technology in North Bangkok, Professor Dr. Suchat Singh Shin, our academic partners, as well as the academic staff. 
from the Faculty of Information Technology and Digital Innovation. Last but not least, we hope that all participants and researchers will get the benefit from this conference and hope to see you all again for next year. Thank you. ในลำดับถัดไปขอเรียนเชิญรองอธิการบดีศาสตราจารย์ดรสมฤกษ์จันทรอัมพรรองอธิการบดีฝ่ายวิจัยและพัฒนาเทคโนโลยีสารสนเทศมหาวิทยาลัยเทคโนโลยีพระจอมเก้าพระนองคอเหนือกล่าวเปิดงานครับ Presenters participants ladies and gentlemen Professor Dr สมฤกษ์จันทรอัมพร the vice president is going to give the opening speech please make welcome สวัสดีครับ Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure today uh, to give a short speech to open the national and international conference on computing and information technology. Well, I think today we have no question about the importance of information technology, especially in this period, because it is a period that we have to distance from each other physically, but in the same time we have to close to each other. More and more digitally, and we can see that digitalization will become a new normal, and then a recurrent norm in our society. So this is why I'm very happy that today we gather together uh, to this conference in order to share the new idea and knowledge and the recent research in this field. So I do hope that uh, you all will have the fruitful results. Have. More new idea, have more new friends, and have a new network. And I would like to thank all partners who help organize this conference. And I would like to declare the opening of the national and international conference on computing and information technology. สวัสดีครับขอเรียนเชิญ keynote speaker ท่านที่หนึ่งดรพงศธรสายสุดสิทจากมหาวิทยาลัยเทคโนโลยีพระจอมเก้าพระนครเหนือ For the first keynote speaker, please welcome Dr. Phong Thon Sai Sujarit from King Mongkut University of Technology, North Bangkok. Good afternoon, everyone. Hope you are healthy and safely during this difficult time. Thank you for joining this session. This is my pleasure to be a part of this conference today. I am going to talk about understanding space tech development and how small satellites are changing the world. All right, this is the outline of the presentation today. Hope you enjoy and find some useful information from my session. Firstly, let me introduce myself. My name is Phong s a t o n Currently, I am an acting director of International Institute of Space Technology. For economic development at KMU GNB, I would like to share a story about myself. I have a background in space engineering, and my specialization is in satellite systems, particularly in nano micro satellites. The current projects I am working on will be presented in the later part of this presentation. During my undergraduate to doctoral degrees. I had a great opportunity to work on some of the very exciting satellite projects at the universities in Japan. We were one of the world's pioneers in nano micro satellites class. Let me go back in time a little bit more about how it all started for me. When I was in the secondary school in Thailand, Thailand has the first communication satellite called Tycoon One. Some of you may familiar with this name because Tycom is the first Thai-owned satellite. It was launched in 1993. The TV live coverage of the event mesmerized me, and that was the whole inspiration for me to pursue a space engineering career. Fast forward to now, I would like to share you with some of the experiences I have accumulated all my life. So. I hope you will find my story useful. In this session, I would like to give some general information about small satellites. As a historical background, the left picture, Sputnik One, 
was the first artificial Earth satellite. The Soviet Union launched it into space in 1957, orbiting for three weeks before falling back to the atmosphere. The middle picture of Explorer 1. It was the first U.S. spacecraft. Was launched in 1958. Returning data until its battery were exhausted nearly four months. In the right picture, Japan is the first country in Asia to have a capability to launch their own first satellite called Ozumi in 1970s. It has been 53 years since human has sent the first satellite into space. In 1957, the U.S. sent astronauts to the moon and back to Earth in 1969. Today, we have had several thousand of satellites orbiting around the Earth. Technologies has been developed rapidly in the fields of semiconductor and electronics, which enhance the capability of satellites and spacecraft. The miniaturization, along with the computing power, we can send more data back to Earth with low power consumption and smaller devices. This basically means that we can better utilize satellites at a much lower cost. This basically means that we can better utilize satellites at a much lower cost. As you see in this slide, there are many applications for satellites, such as internet satellite. Stalling is very well known right now. GPS satellite, Earth observation satellite. You might have seen on TV news when the country has faced the flood disasters. Satellites are orbiting around the Earth in different orbits, depending on the purpose and applications. Communication and weather satellites are mostly in the geostationary orbit. Navigation satellites are in the medium Earth orbit and Earth observation satellites are in the low Earth orbit. Recently, there are some satellite companies providing services in space, for example, such as Space Debris Removal Service. This is a Singapore satellite company called AstroScale. In terms of small satellites, generally, it means satellites having under 200 kilograms weight. This class of satellites varies between several hundreds to several tons. This is close to the size of a minibus. Among small size satellites, CubeSat or Pico satellites are very popular nowadays. Many universities and space tech company around the world and even space agency like NASA, ESA, are developing and making use of these tiny satellites. Let's take a look at CubeSat and normal size satellites side by side virtually. Here's a side comparison between normal size satellites and the CubeSat. You simply cannot see where the CubeSat is in comparison to the normal satellite size here. Of course, when the site gets smaller, its capabilities are also limited. The bigger a satellite is, the more resources are required. In other words, it's expensive and it takes more time and more people to build. Since the years of 2000, the numbers of small satellites have been launched into space is increasing every year. And today, more than thousands of small satellites are being launched annually. One of the main reasons is to reduce cost. Also, using a group of small satellites in a constellation generally is better than using just one satellite alone. However, this does not mean that small satellites will replace big satellites. There are many things that big satellites can do, but small satellites cannot. This is an example of one of the most successful small satellite companies in the world 
called Planet Labs. These five people developed it, keep us in their own garage in Silicon Valley. They have also sent lots of CubeSats to monitor the entire Earth in constellations. These CubeSats can update the images of any area on the Earth every day. Imagine that Google Maps are being updated every day. This is extraordinary. This video shows how low Earth's orbit small satellites work in constellation. As you can see, the more satellites in the orbit, the more frequent the data can be updated or the more we can connect to the satellite easily. In this session, I would like to talk about CubeSats. The idea of CubeSat was proposed in 1998 for the first time. At the beginning, the main purpose was for space education. The idea of quick and low cost development makes CubeSats so popular all over the world. Today, even primary school students can have a chance to make a CubeSat and send it into space. One unit size of CubeSat is 10 cubic centimeters. The standard configurations allow larger size such as 1U, 3U, and 6U. The potential of CubeSat is so high beyond our expectation. Let's take a look at this example. This is the picture of CubeSat called Marco, developed by NASA. Marco are twin spacecraft. They were sent to Mars for deep space mission. On the left side is the picture of Mars taken by Marco. This is the CubeSat project supported by ESA. Their various missions range from Earth observation to deep space exploration. In this session, I would like to talk about how to build a satellite. Before starting to build a satellite and send it into space, there is a small satellite simulator called CANSAT. Yes, CAN means juice can. CANSAT is a juice can size satellite simulator. This is very useful for space engineering education. Of course, we don't send it into space, but for proof of concept mostly. Generally, we test CANSAT by using a model rocket or dropping it from a drone with parachute. This is a recorded footage of the experiment that we sent our CANSAT into sky four kilometers high above sea level with a model rocket. There are CANSAT competitions going around the world right now. This is also one of the historical photos of CANSAT. It was the first CANSAT competition held in Black Rock Desert in USA in 1999. There were many students from Japan and US participating in the competition. It was our first time to build a satellite. Of course, we failed. We still remember the moment we cried and pat on each other's back. We learned a great deal before successfully building a working CubeSat and sending it into space. One year later, we started designing and building a CubeSat, which was the world's smallest satellite at the time. Back then, space grade components were expensive and we had no money. Luckily, there were electronics shops in Junkyard Market near our university called Akihabara in Japan. Many cheap and good electronic parts could be found there. Sometimes you could get very expensive and high value components at very, very cheap price. Of course, if you are lucky. This was the first satellite I had developed in my life. Yes, we brought many things from Akihabara. It's pretty much like Ban Mo in Thailand. We squeeze everything in it, a 10 cubic centimeters box. We had built many models 
of the satellite and conducted a numerous tests in space-like environment, such as vibration tests. This process is to ensure that our satellite could survive during the rocket launch. In lower Earth orbit, satellites must survive in the extreme thermal condition, such as 200 to minus 200 degrees Celsius every 40 minutes cycle. So the thermal cycling test comes in handy here. Since space is vacuum, there is no air convection. Thermal vacuum test must be carried out because CPU fan and heat fin cannot be used. Like mobile phone, communication antenna should be able to send and receive signal in any direction. Our satellite antenna was made of a tape meter. 20 years ago, there were no such tiny satellites like CubeSat before. Many rocket launch companies refused to bring our satellite to space. My professor used his pocket money and brought the students to Russia. He told the owner of the Russian rocket company that these students would be one day become the leaders driving Japan's space industry in the future. Please help them. Luckily, the company emphasized and shifted out of a CubeSat to space. This could be also one of the main reasons many satellites from Japan have been launched by the Russian rockets until today. Then, about one week later, we received the first photo of the Earth from space. This was one of the greatest moments putting me speechless. It's been 20 years now. Those pioneers who saw in the pictures are still based on what they learned from the CubeSat, despite different career parts. This is the student team leader, Suda Yuichi, who became the project manager, one of the most successful spacecraft in the world, Hayabusa 2. He was the youngest project manager in the history of JAXA, Japan's space agency. Do you remember the pictures of broken CANSAT in previous slides? Yes, that was his starting point. Many of our team members went to NASA. One of them is Masashiro Ono. He became a space engineer at JPL and one of the team members of Mars Rover Perseverance. This is another person I would like to introduce to you, Mr. Yuya Nakamura. He became the CEO and founder of Axel Space Company, the Japan number one startup space tech company right now. For myself, I came back to Thailand and became a lecturer at KMU TNB. I have been teaching students here about how what I learned in Japan. We have successfully built and launched first time made satellite called NACSAT in 2018. As expected, many electronic parts we bought were from Banmo. In the following year, we started teaching the high school students how to design and make a satellite. These students are grade 10 to 12 from Bangkok Christian College. Just a month ago, March 2011, they have launched their own satellite called BCC Sat 1. It's orbiting in space at the moment and working great. They are now trying to get the first NDVI image from the Earth. Very exciting. This is the last session. I would like to provide some specific aspect of space technology. You might know this already, but I would like to remind you again. Space is expensive and risky. One does not go to space for the sake of it. We all have some reason and satellite is a non-repairable system once you launch it into space 
you can fix it. Finally, the most important thing to about what we have learned is about failure. Failure is an option if we learn from it. Fail, fail often and early. Failing smart is the best way to learn, grow, and eventually succeed. You don't learn anything from success, but you learn a lot from your failures. Some key people that have said these words are Deva Newman, NASA Deputy Administrator, and the last one is from Elon Musk. SpaceX CEO. We come to the end of my session. Hopefully, we can all meet in person again very soon. Thank you. Colin Chen, keynote speaker, Tan Di Song, Professor Doctor Doctor Wolfgang A. Harlan, from Fern University in Hagen, Republic of Germany. For the second keynote speaker, please welcome Professor Dr. Dr. Wolfgang A. Harlan from Fern University in Hagen, Germany. Ladies and gentlemen, in this presentation, I'm not going to show you anything new. In fact, what I shall show you is known for up to two centuries. As computer science pretends to be always at the cutting edge of technology, Effective solutions to fundamental problems were forgotten, or are even suppressed, and the wheel is reinvented all the time, thus becoming more and more square. Malicious software in form of viruses, worms, Trojan horses, or executable internet content called malware does not only cause big economic losses. But endangers the functional safety of computers. This is particularly important for industrial and other automation systems, on whose correct functioning humans often depend with their health and even their lives. Contrary to statements of the opposite, malware does not constitute a technical problem. In this talk, we shall see that literally, the problem was already solved some 180 years ago. The situation in cryptography is similar. There exist secure methods of one-time encryption, which are not only systematically non-breakable, but also simple and easily understandable. Their use can prevent eavesdropping and data spying in a sustainable way. It makes no sense to search for malware having intruded into computers. It may already be too late, or the search may fail. Better is to prevent. Therefore, inadequate computers and vulnerable Windows operating systems should not be used. It is interesting to note that the NSA, the secret service of the United States, uses Linux and that classical mainframe computers have never been hacked nor infected with malware so far. The fundamental principle of prevention is to block the operational principles of malware, so that malware cannot function. As conventional, software-based methods do not work, adequate computer architectures should be employed. Hardware-supported security measures are the only way to achieve this goal. The most suitable approach to solve the problem is the one applied by Alexander the Great in the year 334 BC to solve the Gordic Knot. Whereas it had been tried for centuries to unravel the knot's loops, with his sword he just cut through the knot very effectively. The fundamental problem is that malware can attack computers only because according to the prevailing von Neumann architecture, data and program code are stored, fully mixed up in common memories. In addition, software-based defense mechanisms are insecure and inherently vulnerable, and programs are allowed to be executed and to use resources without having been granted explicit user permission for this. The so-called Harvard architecture is even older than von Neumann's. 
its principle dates back to the analytical engine devised by Charles Babbage in 1837 and to the Z1 electromechanical computer built by Konrad Zuse in 1936. The architecture completely separates data from instructions and therefore it is immune against malware intrusion by design, since program code Pride protected by hardware cannot be modified by software. On the left hand picture, you see Konrad Zuse standing in front of his computer Z3, which was operational in 1944. The Z3 is the first program controlled digital computer worldwide. When you come to Berlin, you find this machine in the Technical Museum. Interesting is a program storage unit of the Z3 shown on the right. During execution of a program, the unit reads instruction for instruction from a tape, which was punched by Mr. Zuse with his own hands. Today we would call the punch tape a read-only memory. This concept is groundbreaking for security, since programs stored in ROMs cannot be changed by malware. The picture on the left shows how the Harvard architecture can be emulated with just a single logic end gate on a von Neumann computer. For this, the main memory is halved, one half for program instructions and the other one for data. The gate resets the processor immediately when the processor tries to read an instruction from the data area in memory. On the right hand pictures, you see a network interface, which is insurmountable in contrast to commonly used firewalls. Network and computer are physically separated from one another at any time. Data are exchanged via the network interface, which can perform checks of all kinds. More subtle and naturally more complex extensions of the von Neumann architecture employ the following measures to protect program code. Segmentation of main and mass memory with hardware implemented write protection. Context sensitive memory allocation. Hardware implemented coupling of write protection with positive user authentication. Endowing page directory and page table pointers of virtual memory addresses with authentication fields that can be checked by memory management units or disclosure of required resources prior to execution. These and other security measures have been patented and could be employed in commercial computers. However, the computer industry ignores them. The same is true with respect to protection of data by encryption, to which we turn now in the second part of this talk. The encryption methods currently in use were already broken or will be broken in the foreseeable future. Actually, they do not even need to be broken because in some countries their keys must be escrowed with national agencies. In 1949, Claude Shannon proved the fundamental theorem that a crypto system is regarded as perfectly safe if there are at least as many possible keys as there are possible messages. Accordingly, satisfactory in the long run can only be encryption with keys as long as the messages and used just once. This is the case for the so-called one-time pad, which was patented by Gilbert Vernon in 1918 and used in the 20th centuries by diplomats, military and secret services. Also, the telex link between the White House in Washington and the Kremlin in Moscow, called Red Telephone, was secured by one-time keys. The one-time pad is a stream cipher, which carries out the exclusive OR operation on each bit of the plain text of a message, with the corresponding bit of a one-time key. The exclusive OR is also known as, as antivalence or inequality. For decryption, a reader of the ciphertext would have to solve in each bit position one equation with two unknowns. 
Since this is mathematically impossible, the method is unbreakable. One-time keys may be obtained best by utilizing physical phenomena, for instance, by sampling white noise. The problem is to have long keys available simultaneously at, at both senders and receivers. This can be achieved, for example, by depositing the only two key copies of a key set with the communication partners. This approach is applicable in many areas like internet banking or autonomous driving. If this is not possible, however, one has to resort to keys which are calculated at the sender and receiver sites by synchronously running generators of pseudo-random bits beginning with common initial values called seeds. In the course of this, the seeds are newly set sufficiently often and at random for example by reading out homes, whose memory cells are addressed by the ITAN method of online banking. In principle, one-time encryptions based on pseudo-random bit sequences as keys might be broken, although with extremely high effort. Furthermore, it has to be considered that the usual data elements, namely characters, bytes or words, are always encrypted as separate and unaltered units. Shannon's information theoretical model of encryption systems is even tacitly based on this restrictive fundamental assumption. Therefore, the boundaries between data elements and their number can easily be observed in the ciphertext because generally there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the symbols in plain and ciphertext, which is a feature offering a two-hold for code breaking. To remove these weak points, we act from the fact that symbols do not exist anymore in contemporary information technological systems, because everything is binary encoded. Therefore, an encryption scheme should employ the most general form of replacing one bit pattern by another one, which allows to blur the boundaries between plain, te plain text symbols, to randomly select among several encryptions of a single bit pattern, and to have more bit positions in the ciphertext than in the plain text. As shown in the figure, and according to a patent of mine granted in 2005, to obfuscate symbol boundaries, the number M of bit positions to be jointly encrypted is selected at true random and modified frequently. The number M shall be odd and different from the number of bit positions K encoding the plain text alphabet. In technical realizations, K is generally 8. Then, with n greater m, any m bit positions each are encrypted by truly random selection from a number of possible images under a secret, also varying uh, relation r realized in form of a lookup table. The inverse relation is a surjective or onto mapping providing unique and exhaustive decipherability. For instance, there are 10 to the power of almost 1 million relations R, inverting deciphering for the practical case M equal to 17 and N equal to 24. In contrast to current crypto systems, R is to be kept secret. Let the following two operations be given. First, encryption. Encrypt a data packet with a pseudo-random one-time key at e of equal length. Second, obfuscation. Partition the resulting bit chain into segments of length M. Truly at random select images under relation R and concatenate the N bits long images. One decrypts by first applying the inverse relation on n bits long segments each and then by applying the bitwise antivalence on the one-time key and the concatenated results. The order of applying the two steps should be reversed once in a while. It is important 
that sender and receiver work synchronously with respect to the states of encryption and decryption, and that these states consisting of pseudo-random bit generators used of seeds N, M and R are changed frequently and truly at random, for which the I10 method may be employed again. As a byproduct, the data packets are automatically authenticated by this complex method. We have seen that adequately constructed computers can securely repel the intrusion of malware without knowing the malware's operational principles in the first place. Further, it was shown that information theoretically secure one-time encryption is the only sustainable means to prevent eavesdropping of data streams, spying out data and unauthorized access to computers, subject to the condition that the deficiencies of one-time encryption are eliminated by obfuscating the boundaries between jointly encrypted data items. Correspondingly constructed new products would have an immense market potential as the world market calls for computer and telecommunication systems with such security properties. What I presented here in short is fully elaborated in a book of mine. Here you see the ISBN of its ebook version. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> For our last keynote speaker, please welcome Dr. Lisa Armstrong from Edith Cowan University, Australia. Hello, my name is Dr. Lisa Armstrong. I am from the School of Science at Edith Cowan University in Perth, Western Australia. The title of my presentation today is Improving Agricultural Productivity with UAV Drone and Sensor Data. This presentation will include an introduction and then I will outline about data collection the technologies that we use to collect the data, issues about data capture and the standards of data, using data in decision tools. I will then outline some case studies and some key messages to come from this presentation. Myself first. I am a lecturer in computer science, but my background is in agricultural science. I have a PhD in agricultural science and I have over 25 years experience in research and about 20 years as a computer science researcher. The majority of the work that I am doing uh, in terms of research is being carried out in Western Australia which is a Mediterranean environment where we have winter rainfall and uh, summer is very hot and dry. In terms of the background of the types of agricultural systems that I am working with, Australia is mostly a broad acre, acre cropping system. It's largely rain fed and is reliant on low rainfall, very poor soil conditions and changes in climate um, in the last few years due to climate change. The main crops that are grown include wheat, barley, oats and canola and lupins in the southern Australian cropping zones. Farmer enterprises in this region of Australia are large in scale and are remote. There is limited internet and mobile coverage is quite patchy. However, growers are embracing new technologies such as sensors and drones to create smart farming enterprise solutions. These technologies can be used to improve decisions related to 
crop agronomy, fertiliser use, disease management and climate forecasting. There are a number of barriers to broadacre farming in Australia. One issue is that mobile connectivity in rural Australia is currently limited and the full benefits of this digital technology has not been reached and decision support systems are reliant on poor information as a result. Extreme weather conditions such as frost, low rainfall and poor soils and diseases can limit productivity. There is also a lack of relevant information to make tactical decisions throughout the season. So how do growers need information to clarify crop issues, to enable better decisions about their farming enterprise? This information needs to be targeted to a specific crop issue to provide the best resolution. Ongoing decisions throughout the season for agronomic management or to control pests and diseases or to ensure the best yield and quality of the crop need to be made. Farming is about minimising risks based on variable climate, farming resources and markets. These can all dictate the sustainability and profitability of the farm. In terms of the data which is collected in the agricultural systems, there are a number of traditional and newer technologies which are being used to uh, collect the data and provide that information to the farmer. Australian farmers get cultivar recommendations based on national crop breeding trials called na national variety trials and these programs are really expensive to conduct and manage and do not cover all the locations throughout the growing regions. There are also some on-farm trials which do exist where farmers work with researchers to collect data using their own tractors and harvesters and spray rigs. The field collection of data is both time consuming and can require technicians that are skilled and may require technicians to travel long distances to these field sites. Recent technology advances has seen the development of smart farms which have local WAN and mobile network integration to automate some of this data collection in the paddock. Integrating field sensors with UAV and remote sensing satellite data into decision systems could provide an improvement on the process of developing new cultivars and crop management practices. Here we see on the right of this slide an example of one of the information portals which is provided by the Grains Research and Development Corporation. It is a simple decision tool which allows the growers to choose the region where they're from and what crop and variety they are interested in and they can tell in terms of uh, the climate and the soil types and what are the expected yields of those crops. One of the major issues that we have in Australia and especially in Western Australia is that there is poor mobile and wide area network coverage. Mobile coverage is limited. As you can see this uh, satellite image of an area just outside of Perth there is only a limited coverage which is in the green patches of mobile coverage. The rest of the area there has no mobile coverage. LoRaWAN and other alternative local networking solutions are being investigated to assist in this uh, technology advancement. 
Low bandwidth technologies are cheap to implement, but they also have issues. One possible solution is the use of mobile edge computing. Mobile edge computing is a cross-platform solution which includes cloud, mobile and sensor technologies. The use of mobile edge-based technologies and LP WAN systems for rural areas is gaining momentum in Australia. These technologies involve the collection of data through field sensors or drones and edge computing is used to transfer this information over cellular networks to cloud servers where different uh, processing either using AI or other analytics can be used to provide information to the to the farmers or researchers using the control station dashboards. The main type of sensors which are used across agricultural systems are the field sensors. These are sensors that are placed within the crop to take different types of measurements. These measurements could be plant or crop data, measurements about the soil and the soil water, also measurements about climate or weather data. As you can see on the right, this is a, a field trial which is taking collections of, of uh, different uh, information in a field crop and they're using solar panels that, to uh, run the batteries for those sensors. The problem with these sensors is that the majority of these sensors in the field are quite old. They are not well calibrated and there's issues with poor battery life. It also uh, uh, results in limited connectivity and the need for ground truthing and validation with these sensors. There are many sensors which are used uh, in uh, cropping to provide information about the crop. These mostly relate to temperature, humidity and radiation sensors. There are also specific sensors that will measure uh, chlorophyll content or leaf water content or soil water or wind speed for example. These sensors are relatively inexpensive but uh, the ones which are uh, highly precise are more expensive and sometimes are not as durable. The other types of data is usually collected through remote sensing using satellite imagery and there are a number of satellites which fly over Australia um, and provide a number of maps or mapping opportunities uh, for growers. Here's an example of uh, what is available to growers fairly easily and this is through Google Earth. Remote sensing information in terms of satellite images can come from such tools as Google Earth or through government databases. These types of uh, images provide a broad overview of the grower's farm and can provide temporal elevation information that can, uh, that are fairly easy to understand and to determine the overall growth of their crops in different paddocks. There are a number of different tools such as remote sensing tools which uh, uh, provide information that is downloadable by, for the farmer and one example is Land Viewer. It provides a number of free scenes per day and it allows for satellite data to be downloaded for particular areas. In terms of the use of satellite imagery in, for agricultural data analysis, 
Here is an example of a research paper by Zhao et al. 2020, where he looked at uh, the differences in satellite imagery across a number of years. And he looked at the influences of RGB and other uh, determines like photosynthetic vegetation and looked at whether he could tell um, what the differences were across the seasons for different parts of this area in Gundawindi, Queensland. So what, he, what they found um, from this study was that this kind of information could provide paddock history and general trends in the paddock. However, they uh, found that there was a lot of missing data and sensor error due to cloud cover um, during flight paths. The scale was important in terms of what scale they used for the satellite imagery as some of it was not uh, suitable for the purpose, uh, either it was regional paddock or trial related. They did look at uh, variations between RGB and multispectral bands and they highlighted that there's a need to look at both of those types of images. They looked at imagery at a 10 metre resolution, which they found was available for free, and, but it required excessive processing. And the higher resolution passes that they did use, which were only five passes per area per season, were expensive. And they also stated that ground truthing was also essential to find out what was the actual growth of the plants on the ground. So, so let's uh, have a look at um, what UAVs entail in terms of, of agricultural data. UAVs are considered an alternative to costly and time-consuming traditional methods on measuring crop productivity through the acquisition, processing and analysis of high resolution spatial and temporal crop data at field scale. These types of ultra-light unmanned aerial vehicles can be mounted with multispectral and thermal cameras to facilitate monitoring of crops throughout the crop growing cycle and they can allow for timely detection of diseases, for example, and the intervention of those uh, problems. Their use at field or farm scale allows the access to real-time agrometeorological information and crop monitoring at different stages throughout the cropping cycle. There are a number of quite commonly used drones the ones that we are using are the DGI Phantom 4 model and these are fairly lightweight drones uh, and they uh, have facilities to hold RGB and multispectral cameras and are fairly easy to use and to uh, do uh, to use for field studies. In terms of the type of crop data that you can collect using these kind of drones, there's a number of crop traits that can be collected, including things like plant height, vegetation coverage, plant biomass, plant stress levels, chlorophyll content, water stress levels, canopy temperatures, transpiration rates. These can be collected by different types of UAVs some require uh, specialised cameras. The sensors could either be RGB based multi RGB uh, cameras or multispectral cameras or the use of thermal uh, cameras. Each of these types of cameras can also provide information resulting from that collection for different plant indices such as NDVI or the other types of plant indices, uh, which is very useful for understanding the growth and health of the plants. The advantages and disadvantages of using UIVs are 
compared to satellite imagery. So some of the advantages of using UAVs is that they're not limited by cloud cover issues, which you can get um, from temporal conditions. The UAVs can be used flexibly at different times and at altitudes, altitudes and resolutions and can be adjusted to local weather conditions. Images acquired by UAVs can offer observations of single plants or single field plots. However, the disadvantages of UAVs are that the UAV, UAVs and cameras are costly, which can limit their use. And the main limiting factor of UAV imagery is that there's small coverage per image. Let's have a look at some studies which have um, been reported about the use of UAV imagery for monitoring crop trials. This is a study by Guan et al. 2019 and this study was looking at uh, mapping of the growth of wild rice and he, he used both satellite imagery and also imagery that was collected by drones and he found that um, the drone imagery could be used to examine the plots of rice at a plot level, a very um, high resolution plot level, and even to down to the single individual plant. And they were able to use the drones to track through the season the growth of the uh, wild rice and also um, monitor the NDVI uh, indices of that growth. Another study has found that, sat that UAV images are better than satellite images. This study by Namo et al. in 2020 found that the UAV images were able to find uh, down to a fairly high resolution individual trees within an orchard whereas the satellite image was limited in terms of being able to recognise those individual trees. There are issues though with using UAVs or drones and some of these are quite significant. There is a great variation in the data or the images that you collect, uh, which is determined by the height that you fly the drone, the angle at which the camera is, and also the speed at which the drone runs across the plot. There is also major issues with the calibration of cameras. And one of the major issues is a very limited battery life. And this can result in the use of numbers of batteries um, for one run of a particular trial. Each battery may only last for 10 to 15 minutes of drone flying. Flying conditions such as really high wind can, can limit the time that you can fly the drones. And drones, using drones can be expensive if you crash the drone or the need to uh, constantly get spare batteries or to resupply the batteries. In Australia there's a requirement for licensing if you're going to fly drones and one of the other issues which relates to some of the work that we're doing is that there's major issues in terms of how the images are patched together and this is something it's usually done automatically in some of the software using PIX4D, for example, but the accuracy of that patching is in question. There's also a need for ground truthing. There's no point in taking the drone images if you don't have the, the information about the crop so that you can co correlate the, the crop to the drone image. So some of the other issues that um, are important in terms of 
uh, collecting data um, from drones or, and sensors is that there are multiple data sources, formats available, and there is limited access to some of this data. So in terms of drone data, there is a lack of data standards for drones and for sensor data. Multiple data formats are also existing and these are in various resolutions. There is also the major issue of data fusion and the patching inconsistencies that we have seen in drone images. There is also problems with a restricted access from some other sources such as the government databases. There is also some commercial restriction to some data. For example, the John Deere tractors uh, provide sensor data to the farmer, but that the actual data itself is not provided. It is just a summary of the data. The rest of the data is commercially owned by John Deere. There is also uh, access to the raw data is not available as some drone companies do not provide the raw data to the researchers or to the farmers. There seems to be a need to establish data co-ops, farmer data co-ops, to allow farmers to share this data. I think this is really important step if that does occur. So growers use the data so they, uh, growers use this information through the use of decision tools. Some of these decision tools are provided by the government. In Australia, there are also a number of companies which provide very good information portals to the growers, which allow them to uh, take drone images, analyse those drone images, and take samplings, samples of the crop and to correlate the drone images to allow them to do paddock maps for fertilizer uh, application and monitoring of crop health and also determining uh, final crop yields. So one of these uh, decision tools is Ag World and that is available to growers to use at a cost. There are other companies which provide uh, information uh, through different services. CSBP is a very major, large fertiliser company in Australia. It has its own tool called Decipher and it provides uh, paddock maps of, for farmers and it also does um, crop testing of fertiliser content and it shows the variations in the growth of the crop and where different parts of the crop need to be fertilised. So growers use this kind of data um, in various different ways. Another example is a company called Data Farming and it provides uh, a, a service to the growers um, to allow them to map the paddocks and it provides NDVI measurements of the paddocks to allow them to know which parts of the paddock are growing well or which parts are, are going to provide low yield. So the main thing that we have found uh, in terms of studying the uh, use of UAVs and sensors um, to provide information to the growers uh, and to be able to provide growers with the best ideas of what plants and crops that they should grow is that there's a need to develop a good workflow which in incorporates the UAV imagery and the satellite imagery and it uses the other ground truthing data to provide a kind of model approach which allows them to uh, use those, those generic models to provide the best decision support tools. One study by Yang et al is similar to 
the approach that we have taken um, in developing this kind of workflow approach to be able to choose plants that are best suited for a particular growing situation. Other frameworks exist uh, in, um, in terms of developing um, the integration of UAVs into agricultural management. Nayama uh, et al. 2020 provided a really good overall framework for how UAV and other types of data could be integrated into uh, ways to model crops and to provide better solutions for crop management. I just want to go quickly through some case studies which will show you the potential for using drones within um, cropping. This is Gao et al. They, um, there's a research paper which was uh, published in 2020 and they provided a um, uh, tool which was an agricultural IoT platform which used drones and uh, LoRaWAN and cloud technologies and also used um, different um, computer technology, uh, computer processing to be able to uh, predict the patterns of uh, pests within a field. And the drones were able to take the images and through the um, tool they were able to to determine which patches were in, infested with particular pests. Another interesting uh, case study was by Han et al. 2019. They used drones uh, to take measurements of cropping uh, field trials and they provided quite a sophisticated system including uh, different uh, computer uh, AI techniques such as neural networks, uh, support vector machines and, and correlation to be able to uh, predict the growth, uh, the above ground biomass of maize um, by using drone images taken throughout the season. Coming to the study that we have in Western Australia, we are undertaking a study in Western Australia which is looking at frost tolerance in wheat and this study site we have field sensors we're taking crop measurements and we have established our own mobile tower to um, use as the um, technology to send the information we are taking thermal imagery and we are trying to fuse all that data together to be able to predict which of the varieties are best in terms of being tolerant to frost occurrences throughout the season. So this uh, research is ongoing. The, we have not yet published the paper associated with this, this research. It will come out this year. So just finishing up, the key messages that can come from this uh, talk is that there is a real need for low power networking to provide possible solutions for broad acre farming. We are moving towards multiple, multiple IoT sensors in paddocks which can provide farmers with techniques to get more data for decision making. UAVs can provide farmers with an option for visually monitoring crop changes for large scale cropping issues. There are many free tools available for processing UAV, UAV imagery. However, only experienced farmers and researchers can interpret the results. There is a need to develop workflows to integrate UAV sensor and satellite data and machine learning and crop modeling techniques to improve that decision making. This research is done by ECU e Agriculture Research Group and some of our collaborators with various organisations uh, in Western Australia and overseas. Thank you. This is the references from the talk and <clears throat> thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to 
answer those.